that this story should create all kinds of energy and excitement. I mean, a young man was raised from the dead. And yet, in two study groups this week, with the Panera group on Tuesday and the Wednesday and the Wednesday snacks and scripture group, we all looked at each other and said, I don't know what to do with it. And I can't quite figure that out. In fact, I've spent the whole week wondering, what is it we are supposed to do with this story? What is it we're supposed to learn? How is it supposed to impact our lives? And this morning, listening to Galatians again, I thought, why didn't you preach on Galatians? <laughs> but here's the thing I noticed from the very beginning. This story involves two large crowds. Now, it's the sort of detail you could just skip right over. But Jesus comes from Capernaum to Nain, which is a bit of a distance. And he has a large crowd following him. Now, my guess is they heard what happened in Capernaum. Or they heard the rumors or they've been down to the marketplace, or let's be perfectly honest. It's kind of a dull day. And you could use a little entertainment to break up the boredom because, you know, it's work and weed and work and weed, and that's pretty much what your life is. So you heard about Jesus and you said, Let's go see what's going on. So he has a large crowd following him. And Jesus enters this village. And there is another large crowd. And they are gathered for an entirely different reason. And here, it, there's no sense of afternoon excitement. No sense of let's kill a little time. Instead, the emotion in this crowd is raw and deep. For when someone dies in this time period, they need to be in the ground within 24 hours. There is no take 36 hours and then go visit the funeral home and have a chance to chat amongst yourselves and then you plan the funeral for a day and a half later. like that. The breath goes out of them and they're in the ground. And so it's so easy. It's so easy to feel this mother's pain. But her pain is not simply for the loss of her child, which is enormous. Her pain is likewise for the future that is only dark in front of her. And everyone who's gathered around her, the villages were small at that time, they not only feel her pain, they likewise know how perilous her future will be now that this only son of a widow is dead. Two crowds. One looking for a little entertainment, and one looking for a miracle. And in the middle, on the road, is Jesus. Now we focus on this group over here, on this young man who Jesus brings back to life. But of course, Jesus has given life to more than just the young man. He has given life to the mother as well. When we speak of resurrection, we speak of hope. We speak of how tomorrow doesn't have to be the same as today. We talk about how you can't imagine what tomorrow will be like. That's what we talk about. That's what she was hoping for. It was hope beyond hope. And despair beyond despair. And this crowd over here doesn't mean to be disrespectful. I mean, it really isn't. It has some sense of what's going on because they 
have the same customs. But that wasn't exactly why they were here, and really they didn't know the boy to begin with. And on any given day of the week, we're standing in one crowd or the other. On any given day of the week, we are either spectators to what God is doing in the world, looking for a little of excitement, enjoying some sort of uplifting day, or we're here with this crowd, and we cannot breathe. And we are in desperate need of the Lord's favor. And there's Jesus in the middle of the road. When I went to seminary, one of my favorite professors would say, when you do theology, you're going to fall into one ditch or the other. Meaning, it is very difficult to effectively talk about God and how God works in the world without falling into one heresy on one side or one heresy on the other. And that's not because theology is so hard, it's because God is so deep and mysterious and we are human beings. But here we have it. I thought it was such a good example. We got Jesus in the middle, and we either fall off on the left, sort of going on with our day, looking for something to break it up, you know, to see if God can pull something off today. Or we're on the other, and we're in desperate need of God's action in our life today. Two large crowds. And on any given day, we are in one or we're in the other. So this raises some questions for me. How long did it take this group over here to figure out that what they had experienced was beyond just a miraculous, exciting sort of miracle, he's a prophet thing, and it was something bigger, something divine. And how long did it take before that widow could literally catch her breath again and trust that her son was not going to keel over at any given moment and leave her one more time? That this in fact was a gift and it had to be from God and it was a gift for a lasting time and she was being invited to simply live into that gift. How long? And the folks over here, now I'm going to tell you, if it were me, I'd be in one of two places in this crowd. I'd be way, way, way in the back because crowds make me crazy. Or I'd be way, way, way in the front because I'm so short I can't see any room unless I'm in the front. But let's put you way, way, way in the back. How long would it be before you sent a little note through the crowd to pass this up, you know, like you used to do in school? God, I have a favor to ask you. In fact, that's what our prayers all too often sound like. God, I have a favor to ask you. And over here I ask. When she told the story of this day, when others in the village told the story of this day, did they name the name of Jesus? Did they realize that this was a one-off? This is not something that's going to happen again and again? Did they talk about the day that God walked into name and granted life to their community? What did the people say when it was all over and they moved on to stop for lunch? What did they say? What had they seen? Who 
Did they think Jesus was? And did they start looking for him to do something more in the future? Last week we heard in the gospel, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and you do not do the things I tell you? And Jesus could ask that question again, standing in the middle of the road between these large crowds. Only he would put it this way this week. Are you ready? Are you ready to call me Lord, Lord? Are you ready? to step into the road and to follow the divine life? Are you ready to see me as God acting in your life? Are you ready to leave the back of the crowd where you have to say, what did they say? What did they say? Are you ready to come forward? Are you ready to name the name of Jesus when you see God at work? Are you ready? Are you ready to call me Lord, Lord, and now do the things that I have told you to do so that you too might taste of life, so that you too might live into this great gift of hope and tomorrow? Are you ready? I believe that a great deal of this story is intended once again to ask us where we stand and what road we're going to take and who we're going to follow. Amen.